Death Metal, The Last 52, War of the Multiverse Issue 1 heads back to Themyscira, where a young Diana witnesses her first Amazonian funeral, where her mother takes her to honour Alia, a great warrior who fought against Hercules. Approaching the body, Diana asks her mother if now the warrior will be with her friends again in the afterlife, making the girl think that death is a blessing if that's really the case. Suddenly the corpse springs to life, grabbing her and saying that death is a horrible, horrible fight. In the present, the now giant golden Wonder Woman confronts the darkest Knight, who knows he's already won since he killed Perpetua and now the deaths of Wonder Woman and her world is just an encore for him. Wonder Woman says that she went to the Forge of Worlds to try and find a way to beat the villain but in the darkness she learned that they are all one universe and it all matters and they all matter, even the villain. The Knight knows that he's all that matters, having turned a sad boy in an alley into a god and Wonder Woman has become everything she has despised. Diana grapples the Knight with her lasso, wanting to bring the truth to the villain but he he just laughs, saying that she needs to look up into the sky at the new and final worlds that he has made. Worlds where damsels in distress has killed their saviors and worlds where a mother of the ocean turned her child into a weapon of war. He says that these and other worlds are the truth and Diana and her friends are the great lie of the multiverse, the lie of hope. The heroes of the multiverse meanwhile combat the Dark Earth counterparts, with Alan Scott and Hal Jordan briefly reuniting as the young heroes battle Robin King and his Groblins. Soon a Wally from from a dark earth who continued killing after the sanctuary incident finds them, firing on Aqualad and the other heroes, but the prime universe Wally West saves them, knowing this version of him is a fear from a world where he didn't stop killing, and a world where he loved it. The evil Wally asks for his help to kill Barry Allen and become the best Flash there is, but he is killed himself by the zombie Roy Harper, who tells Wally that this isn't him by a long shot, since the Wally he knew would never act like a tool. He remembers being there with him at sanctuary and how they both were hurting, not blaming him for what happened there, but Wally does still owe him. Wally kills a villain sneaking up on Roy, knowing that he owes a lot of people a lot of things. The two friends continue their friendly competition, taking out more villains as Jay and Barry join Wally, knowing this war is going to go from impossible to hopeless very fast and they need backup. Luckily, the rest of the Flash family arrive with Kid Flash, working together against an evil Swamp Thing as the Darkest Knight knows Diana is aware hope on a battlefield is a killer wanting her to gaze upon reality and tell him what she sees. The Darkest Knight shows Diana multiple worlds and stories, asking her what is the truth on the battlefield. Diana knows that war has no happy ending and the Darkest Knight notes that yet everyone keeps fighting in her name, risking all of their lives for her. Diana sees that Cheetah is being killed by one of the Groblums as suddenly the Darkest Knight pulls her power from her, telling her Cheetah will live long enough to see the end of the multiverse. Smashing Diana into the ground, he says she is no god, since gods are cruel like him. He demands that she submit to him, and if she asks nicely, he'll stop the pain and her final moments in the multiverse will be peaceful. Diana remembers her childhood again, sneaking out to see the statue of Alia being built. Hippolyta finds the girl, knowing that she was scared by the corpse. She tells Diana that Alia lived a good life but was filled with regret, so they added her statue to the garden since she was in the war. Diana asks what she meant when she said death is not a blessing, learning from her mother that Aaliyah was scared by war, only surviving it because she didn't push as hard as her sisters, and if she had given everything without fear, all her sisters would still be living, knowing that she would have rather given everything and died than her death hold no meaning. In the present, Wonder Woman tells the villain that she would rather die than submit, attacking the villain who is more than happy to accommodate her wishes, since her death cry will signal the end of the multiverse. Diana says that the only sound the multiverse is going to hear is her kicking his ass. Out in the battlefield, the Superman family confront the superiors of the ancient House of El. Superman tells them this doesn't have to happen, but the villains know it does. Clark, however, was talking to the Last Son, meeting with the flaming Superman, and trying to get Clark to remember who he is and what the symbol on his chest means. As the family hold back the monsters around them, Clark offers his hand to the Superman, wanting them to join forces, but the Last Son attacks. John is shocked at his father his defeat, knowing that he's not even trying as Clark battles the last son, knowing that some part of him still believes in truth, justice, and tomorrow. The Superboys meanwhile battle the Saviour and the Shepherd, who manage to get the better of Connor and John. The Shepherd digs Connor's jacket, joking about the spikes on it hurting him, however they really don't. The Saint finds it an honour to meet the Kent boys as Connor tells him he can't kill Superman or Hope, but the Saint wonders how Hope will fare against unthinking and unrelenting brutality, eager to test it out. 
out. The last sun continues to smash Superman around the battlefield, blasting him into the ground as the saint claims victory over him. Superman however gets up, knowing he doesn't need to win. All he needs to do is believe he still can, since that's what hope means. Superman unleashes his Omega Beams on the Last Sun, but again it proves futile as the Last Sun blasts him into the ground. The Saint says that hope is the refuge of insignificance like him, embarrassed to share his name and blood. He asks if Clark really thinks his people can stand up to them when even the Superman cannot. Superman says that there is always hope as Lex, the Eradicator, Cyborg Superman and Zod arrive, taking their pent up rage against the Man of Steel out on the Saint and his men, as Lex tells Clark that they may have been opponents or adversaries but at the end of the day, even they know Superman is on the side of life. Superman takes down the Saint with one punch before he can try and kill the Cyborg Superman, but the anti-life in him weakens him further, making Clark unable to go on. He tells Kara not to give up and she promises her cousin they won't rallying the family and telling them that Superman doesn't give up and now they are all Superman. Out in the wastelands, the Flash and the Bat families continue to wage war against the Dark Earths. Batman knows that he has his own limits though, but he knows he's also been able to push himself way past them. He knows had he not died months ago, he would be dead now, but his family is still alive and they are coming to their limits. The family tirelessly battle the villains as Bruce finds himself so proud of them for pushing past beyond their limits and doing so without thinking. Batman soon confronts the Grim Knight, taking him down before rallying the family behind him to push forward. Suddenly the reanimated Batman who laughs attacks Bruce, who tries to tell himself it's not the real villain, just a corpse powered by the Black Lantern ring. So how is he resisting him? The villain says that he was prepared for it, gloating about Bruce's kids all dying before revealing that he had his own Black Lantern ring. Bruce already knew that which is why he bound the villain to him with necromancy from Jason Blood. The two continue to one-up each other on who's more prepared for the other, as the Batman who laughs soon reveals that he wanted to have a few last words at the end of everything, knowing either the cosmic version of him will win and destroy all before turning on the multiverse and omniverse, so what happens there won't matter, but he does know the villain could always lose and then everything will be reborn and he'll be trapped back down in the dark multiverse. Batman wonders what his point is, learning that the villain wants to keep those who live afraid enough that it counts to him, keeping nightmares about him fresh in people's minds as he kills as many as he can. Batman laughs, knowing that there is only one person who needs to keep afraid and one who can picture all of the horrible stuff the villain will do. The Batman who laughs knows Bruce is talking about himself, as the man says if the villain doesn't get to fighting, he will forget ever knowing about the villain and all that will be left would be an echo of an echo. The villain laughs, knowing he needs Bruce's as much as Bruce needs him, so the Batman who laughs gets to killing as Bruce Wayne lets go of life and finally joins his dark counterpart in a laugh. Nearby, the Atom watches stunned as the multiverse crumbles around him, knowing that he and none of them should actually be there. Ryan is saved from a blast by Mr. Terrific, who tells the young shell-shocked hero to keep his head in the game since they need to get the Metal Men up and running and use them to possibly shift the Dark Worlds out of phase, slowing down the monsters coming from them. Ryan, however, breaks down, asking why they even doing this since in the end science means nothing there, so what could he, Michael and Will Magnus possibly do? Suddenly the group are attacked by the dark multiverse atom named Ra. Ryan confronts the dark mirror of himself and from the moment they lock eyes, Ryan learns about how this atom is different from him and how he uses radium, an unstable radioactive atom as his power source. The villain knows that Ryan doesn't think this is real and that this should be impossible, not wanting the hero to waste any energy trying to figure it all out, instead just wanting him to submit to death. The villain blasts the hero but Ryan shrinks and hides, however he is still hit by the radioactive beams. Ra finds it pathetic as he turns his attention to the other heroes and the deactivated metal men, telling them that nothing and not even their science or hope matters since everything ends. Ryan agrees, having grown huge in size, crushing Ra under his foot. Mr. Terrific asks if Ryan has ever grown that big before but the boy knows he never has and he shouldn't be able to, however it was something in Ra's radiation that allowed him to do it. Ryan tells Michael that he felt what it was like being on the edge of the unknown and how small it was, forgetting how exciting that all is. Ryan tells his friend that everything about this should tell him that there is no way out of it and science is just a drop in the ocean now and their existence could very well be coming to an end and it very well could all be hopeless, but when has any worthwhile breakthrough happened if people just gave up when things got hopeless? Regrouping with Will, Ryan tells them that it's time to make some metal men. 
Elsewhere, a teary-eyed Lois Lane tells Perry and Jimmy to run as she confronts an evil version of herself and her army, who call for the deaths of all superheroes. The evil Lois shows her the head of her Superman, wanting to see the destruction of this world from its highest peak as Maxima arrives to rescue Lois, telling her her imprisonment was overturned and she was needed, and they need to get Lois as far away as they can. Lois wants to go back and meet the evil Lois, having to know if she really did what she thinks she did. Lois is taken to the top of the Daily Planet to meet with the evil Lois, who instantly kills Maxima, angered her counterpart would ever team with a powered being like her. She grabs Lois, telling her that they are all reflections of their own creation. Dragging Lois over to the edge of the roof, the evil Lois tells her about how Maxima and her Superman fought on their world, and they destroyed much of Metropolis, even killing the young John Kent who was buried in some falling building rubble. Superman apologised for the destruction after this of course, and did an interview with Lois, which is when she used Amber Kryptonite to absorb his powers and cut off his head. She wonders if this earth is burning thanks to their superhero problem, knowing Lois has thought about going rogue once or twice. Lois knows her evil counterpart is right about that, but she wonders how she could ever become this woman. The evil Lois says that she cannot help Lois right this world's wrongs and she needs to save herself for once and everyone she loves. The evil Lois knows that she has been quiet since Lois is actually mulling over this idea or she's saving her voice to call for her Superman to save her, which the villain hopes she does since then she'll help her make things right by killing him. Lois knows that she doesn't need to scream since her heartbeat will be more than enough to tell Clark everything he needs to know. The evil Lois throws her from the Daily Planet roof, demanding that she scream for Superman, but Lois doesn't, since calling Superman is killing him, and her truth isn't what this villain's is, and whatever sacrifice she has to make, she will, since Superman has done it for her and for everyone else time and time again, so now it is her turn. The Titans meanwhile battle a group of monsters, easily beating them, but Raven knows that something definitely is off about that fight. It's too late however as the ground swallows the team up, where they are confronted by the evil versions of themselves. As the team battle the evil titans, Raven hears a voice in her head that she recognises, seeing the shadowy visage of Trigon. She knew her father had to be behind this, but she learns that it's not actually him, it's a version of her who gave in to Trigon. Raven tells her to leave her friends alone since all she wants is her, but the villain wants to kill them all, telling her counterpart that they killed the heroes on their world since they didn't need them, instead choosing Trigon and becoming more powerful than ever. The villain says that the war will soon end, as the Titans are all defeated by their counterparts, but Raven doesn't give up, unleashing her power on the evil Raven, smashing her into the cave wall. The two Ravens square off with one another, with the good Raven telling the villain a story about her own world and how she has a choice between her father's power over honour, but soon she found her true family in that of the Titans. The villain says that she is weak and her world is dead, so it's time to come home and lead the team to their true destiny under Trigon. Raven knows that she might have one on her world, but the villain's future depends on if she would ever let a vicious whisper into her heart, which she knows she won't. Raven blasts back the evil titans, telling them all to take their sick future and go back to hell. The villains are cast down into the pits of hell as the titans are rescued, with Raven knowing that she never knew it would end this way, but she always knew their light would lead the way. Out in the hellscape, the penguin confronts the evil versions of himself, disgusted that someone so cultivated and cultured as him would be these beings. Outraged, Oswald says that he will not have his legacy tarnished by these sadist freaks, flying into battle as he kills one of the penguins. As he fights, Oswald remembers how through everything he still remained in power and rebuilt the machine of civilization when he had to, protecting it when it needed. As he fights, his body morphs into a hideous bird creature which attacks and kills more of the dark penguins. Oswald knows that this is his one last supper to ring in the new year as he remembers a Picus the Glutton, the richest man in Rome, who killed himself after he learned he only had $10 million left. He remembers the man was a notorious cook, eating literally anything he could get his hands on, so Oswald takes a page from his cookbook, eating the villains as he knows the people will ask what a creature like him would do in battle like this, and he knows he'll do whatever he needs to do in order to survive. 
John Constantine meanwhile tries to worm his way out of the battle, wanting to leave it to the tossers in the tights, but Green Arrow knows that if he and his bow can fight, the wizard can join in as well. Soon the battle begins and John is set upon by an evil Superman. The Superman is suddenly killed by a dark multiverse Constantine, who really hoped John didn't think that he would let someone else kill his counterpart. The two Johns battle it out and soon John gives up, asking his dark counterpart for one final request, a drink before dying, having spotted a pub not far from them. As the heroes continue their bloody battle around them, the two Johns head for the bar. The villain wants to know all about John's story, but John just says that he's literally the same bloke as him. He just never went through a heavy metal phase the villain did. The two argue over which bands are better as they reach the pub, both agreeing that their father was a bit of an asshole. In the destroyed pub, they find that there is only whiskey left. The villain asks for his over ice, pointing out that that's yet another difference between him and John. The villain toasts to John's life and how it will be over before he knows it. Both men drink the alcohol, comparing their lives and what other changes they have had throughout their lives, finding some things are very similar while others not really. John asks the villain if he ever tried saving people and he learns his counterpart did for a while, wondering if he ever thinks about the ones he couldn't save. The villain thinks about them all the time, which is when things started going off the rails for him. The evil John tells Constantine that he could be part of the new order that villains are building, learning that while he would run from a fight and the so-called heroes will think that to be cowardice, the villain knows that there is no honour in dying, and he does whatever it takes to survive. The villain knows that John would fit in well with them, but Constantine isn't interested since running from a fight with a bondage Superman isn't cowardice, it's just common sense. And if he ever cared about winning every fight, knowing he would do everything to avoid getting killed. The villain suddenly vomits up blood, dying in his own vomit as Constantine reveals that he poisoned the ice, since it means he'll get to live another day. Looking out at the battle, he knows he should get back out there, but he's going to stay in the bar for one more round. In Slaughter Swamp, the monsters of the DCU battle it out with their counterparts as Swamp Thing knows that they are all seen as monsters, but some choose to be monsters. Some choose with good intentions like Brimstone, while others choose to inflict chaos like Anton Arcane. Alec knows that he has been chosen and is a chooser, but a monster all the same, but what makes a monster is context. Swamp Thing remembers how Alec Holland burned and from the ashes he rose, but he wasn't Alec Holland since he lacked a soul, but Abigail Arcane didn't care, loving him all the same. That is until the Floronic Man was born and threatened to destroy the green by harnessing its power, leading to Abigail to sacrifice herself. The hero knows this is when his dark counterpart diverges from him, since a rage filled the dark multiverse swamp thing, leading to him become obsessed with life, meaning he killed death and its concept, as well as the red and the parliament of trees who tried to stop him but failed. With nothing left to stop him, the being became known as the Swamp King, ruling over all of the undying life. Luckily, Alec has a weapon that this dark copy doesn't have and doesn't understand. Frankenstein meanwhile blasts through the monsters, leading the other monsters against the Swamp King and making it to his giant tree. Alec knows that that with the other monster heroes all representing aspects of the green or the melt or the red or the rot, it would hinder the Swamp King and give him a chance to get close to the king. Alec attacks but is grabbed by the Swamp King, who says that he has already conquered all of the elements and Alec's distraction did nothing, since life must still spread. Alec says that he had hoped that he would win as the villain punches right through him, telling the hero that there is no hope, there is only the Swamp King. Alec knows that there is the two of them, Coming to the king since he is what was once the green and because he is Alec Holland and has a soul, that's something the king doesn't have but desperately wants to become. Alec is absorbed into the Swamp King, taking over the villain's body, saying that they are meant to be one and that they will become Alec Holland. Alec knows that he was spread throughout the king's life thanks to all of him being connected to every living thing he made, knowing that the villain could win against him but he would have to die to stop Alec, who if is defeated means the king too will be defeated since now they are one and the same so he will cease to be the monster and instead become the man regrowing Alec Holland's body from the life tree. Death Metal The Last 52 or War of the Multiverse Issue 1 was yet another fantastic tie-in and one of pretty great importance as we see all of the heroes get into an all-out battle to save the multiverse. I love the opening that we got to see with Wonder Woman battling the Darkest Knight and taking a page from her fellow Amazonians about never submitting 
King, again delivering hints that Diana is definitely going to sacrifice herself in the final issue of Death Metal. Of the stories that were shown here, I will have to say that all of them are pretty much brilliant and right spot on, each delivering a really fun take on the characters during a giant war. Matthew Rosenberg's Constantine story was a lot of fun, highlighting John's deceptive nature and how he'll literally do anything to win, and Magdalene Visago's Superman story was a wonderful example of Superman and his family's quest to find hope and to stand for it, even in the face of certain death and destruction and battles they could not possibly win. With the series drawing to a close, I find myself a little bit sad that we won't get any more of these anthology stories for this event, since they have all been absolute top tier and were just so much fun to read and again expanded the world of death metal and dived into all of these crazy things that Scott Snyder had let these writers come up with, which I think is just really brilliant and it really brought the creativity out in a lot of the DC writers on this book. I'm going to give this issue a 10 out of 10.